that's time. Good. So, without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to the soprano star, Danny Gamalde. <laughs> Danny, how are you, buddy? Thank Danny, you for coming. Danny, it's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, give yourself a clip. Let me plug in here. Before you get clipped. <laughs> I think you already did get clipped on the show, didn't you? No. <laughs> that was his brother. Yes, my twin brother. Got Your twin, okay. Right. Well, technically it was you, Danny. So. Yes, that's right. It was. I have to say, I'm, I'm so excited to be here. It's always been a dream of mine. When my agent sent me, uh, he said, <laughs> I'm going on the Johnny, and I didn't get the last part. I thought it was Carson. <laughs> I thought it was going to be on the Johnny Carson I wish. show. <laughs> All right, Danny, so uh, what age did you start getting into acting? Well, um, it's, it's a long story, but I'll tell it to you. I, uh, I have a PhD in, uh, in computer science. and Good idea. Yeah, yeah. I had a PhD, and I was working at Bell Labs, and I didn't, I didn't enjoy it that much. So uh, I was married at the time, and I would come home, and I would complain about uh, how, how I had to stay with this job, and I didn't like it. And then one day, I woke up, and I said I could be an actor. I don't know why. I have no idea. I acted in grammar school. I, I never acted after that. And I just thought that I could be an actor. I, my father used to put me in the theater down on, uh, my father was a Garfield boy down in South Brooklyn. And I, he used to put me in the Garfield theater with my brother on Sundays after grandma's dinner. And uh, we would stay there for seven hours. I think maybe that had something to do with it. Well, anyway, so. So I, I said, of course, being Italian, it was before the holidays, so, so I, my, my, my poor uh, wife at the time, I, I would come home and complain every day, and uh, she said, why don't you go, go study with Lee Strasberg? I didn't even know who Lee Strasberg was. I mean, yeah. she did, I didn't. And I said, it's the holidays anyway, I'm Italian. You don't do anything till after the holidays are over. <laughs> so after the holidays, I start complaining again. I come home from work, I hate this job, I hate it, I hate it. So I, I go to, I go to Lee, I finally make a call, I go to Lee Strasberg, I get interviewed by a, uh, a, a receptionist, and for some reason she always told me she wanted me to go into a class right then, and I said, I said, no, I don't think so, I'll start on Monday, because mm -hmm. I was an academician, so you start everything on Monday, you take one chapter, acting one, acting two, acting three, by the end of the semester you're an actor, that's what I thought. <laughs> so Lee Strasberg used to give uh, lectures uh, in Carnegie Hall in, uh, in Manhattan, I worked in New Jersey, lived in Brooklyn. I drove to New Jersey, then I, I drove from, this is how naive I was. I drove from New Jersey to Manhattan thinking I was gonna get a parking space in five <laughs> minutes, right? So I'm driving around, I get a parking space at about 6.30, the thing started at six. I walk up the block and I'm getting to, to Carnegie Hall and I get to the door and I say, what am I doing? This is, this is ridiculous. It's so far away from what my life was supposed to be. I was supposed to be a corporate vi president and I said, this is crazy. So I turn around, I start walking down the block. In those days, there was a theater called the Little Carnegie Theater next to the Russian Tea Room. I stopped at the Little Carnegie Theater, and I had this conversation with myself. I said, you know, for the first time in your life, I was good at math and science. When Sputnik went up, we all got money to go to school. So I got a lot of money to go to school. I, I had scholarships to, uh, to college. I had fellowships to graduate school. So I got paid to, to study. I stopped at the little Carnegie Theater and I said to myself, you know, for the first time, this may be a decision that you're making. You're not on a track that you, that you, you, you just were put on because you're good at some. I said, this, this may be your destiny. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, yes, it might be. I turned around, I walked back, I went in to listen to Strasbourg. The next day I went to my first acting class with my f initial acting teacher who was Ed Covens, rest his soul. He was a big burly man and uh, I heard he sounded like my father. My father was a longshoreman, and that's what he sounded like when I was out in the hallway walking in. And I sat in the class, and he, he said to me, first day, I'm, watch, I'm watching, and he said to me, Dan, would you like to get up and do something? I said, of course not. I, I'm just, I'm here for, I've just got here. What, I don't want to do anything. I, I didn't know what to do. So he said I was going to have an improv. So he got me up on stage with a, with a, a black actress and myself. And he said that we were engaged, and the problem was... Her, her parents didn't like me, okay? And all I could think of was, my father was a long Italian longshoreman. All I could think of was, my daddy should see me now. <laughs> Being engaged to a black girl at this point, this is not very, this was 1970, this was. Oh, forget about it. Okay, so from then I studied, I fell in love with it, I, I felt like I was home, and I've, I've loved the craft ever since. That's what it is, you gotta feel it. But listen, this is the question that everybody here wants to talk about, including myself, as a big Soprano fan. How'd you land the part as Patsy Parisi in the HBO hit series of Sopranos? Another, another long-winded story. That's all right, we got time. 
I, I auditioned for Philly Parisi. Philly Parisi, uh, I never asked David Chase about this, but Philly Parisi was a, uh, it was summarized the first season. When they became a hit, a lot of people hadn't watched the first year, and yeah. they became a hit. So Philly Parisi, Spoons, summarizes the whole first season in three pages. Yeah. And he talks about Tony going to the, Tony going to the, uh, uh, to the psychiatrist and all this other stuff. And he's murdered. In, 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 four, in four pages, in four minutes, he gets shot. He's the first new character. Now, the audition took place in, Oct in, in October, uh, and the season had already started in August. So this was like, this is where luck comes into play. You figure in your life, you can see this. So I got cast as Philly, Two day, three days work. In, 19, in 1999, mm -hmm. on episode one of season two. That was my job. I was very happy. Every actor in America wanted to be on The Sopranos. And I had got, and I had a scene basically by myself uh, and in a car, and I get shot. And Alan Coulter was the director, and I said to him, Alan, you think you could miss me? He said, you know, Danny, sometimes the best thing that happens to an actor on this show is they get killed. I said, well, I don't know about that, but OK. <laughs> so what happens is, they were in Naples shooting the uh, Italian scenes mm -hmm. at, that, at that point. They came back from Naples, and they were watching the rushes, the rushes being the, the raw footage. And uh, Chase, Alan Coulter called me up to tell me this, that Chase, they were in a room, and Chase looked at my, my character and, and the part I played, uh, Philly, and said, who's that guy? I like him. I don't want him dead. But he already killed me, so that was a problem. So uh, Coulter calls me up and says, Danny, I want you to hear this. Doesn't mean anything. It's just actors don't get to hear you know, this kind of praise. But David really loved your work. I don't know what that means, but I wanted you to know that. My oldest son was in earshot, and I got off the phone and started saying some bad things. And uh, he said to me, Dad, what do you, what do you ha what, what, why are you doing that? I said, well, I'm tired of being praised. Mm -hmm. I need a job. Right. So then the word came out that they might bring me back. And then they created Philly, uh, Patsy Parisi. Mm -hmm. And on season two, the last episode, there was, a, there was a, a dream sequence on the beach in Asbury Park. And, uh, and I was in it with a hole in my head. And then I also was in uh, one four or five minute scene where I fenced, some, some, uh, I fenced a uh, fur coat that, he gave to, that Tony gives to eat yeah. to, uh, eat to Camilla. And then she's, you know, the old fur coat with nothing on and underneath. So that was pretty good. <laughs> so I started out as three days work and I ended up a regular for seven years. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it was, it's, it's, it, was the, it was the best experience of my, uh, of my acting career. And it was, it was a g great show. The people were great. Chase was a genius. The writers were fantastic. It was the best writing in the history of television. And I, they used to call me Mr. Mr. Happy because every time I was on a set, I would just be whistling and smiling. And I didn't whistle. That's lying. I'm not. I don't whistle. I was smiling and happy. So well, you know what? The Sopranos are going to go down in history, just like say the old James Cagney movies. Yep. The Sopranos will be around forever. Yes, I, sure. I believe that. Yeah, I do. Well, I'm sure you enjoyed working with everybody. He's probably had a great time. Oh, was there anybody terrific. that you palled out with more than the others? Vince or? Curatola. He was. Uh, I'm older than Vince, but he was my big brother. Johnny Sack. He was my older Johnny Sack. Oh, he was my older brother. He he counseled me. We always we sat. We talked. We go, we're still good friends. And most of the cast is really, when we are in contact, we're really close. Right. Some got some people are closer than others, but in general, it's uh, we we had Dominic's 80th birthday. We have Jimmy's 50th birthday party, and it's just when you come together, it's just a, it's yeah. a it's a wonderful experience. Big fan. And it was. You know, everybody was grateful on the show. You know, gratitude is what happiness is. If you're grateful, you're happy. And everybody who worked on that show was grateful because nobody expected it to be what it became. Right. And that was, that was, it was awesome. I worked like four different shows background, but the food and the way they took care of you over there. It was an Ita and, the, and this is not because I'm Italian. It was an Italian set. It, it was really crazy. was. It was. It was. It was an Italian set. The food was Italian. Um, the people, a, a lot of the actors were. And Everything so was, was there. A, pizza, was cold cuts, lasagna. Yeah, we, yeah, we had the best food. Yeah, we had the best food. We were fed very well. It's hard to eat and then go act. It's. It's a little difficult. Oh, definitely. But. Now, we ask all the actors that come here from The Sopranos, in your opinion, what do you think about the movie? Yes, no, maybe? No. No, right? Absolutely not. All right. Why? Any reason? Uh, well, definitively from the horse's mouth, I guess. Okay. No movie. 
All right. Spanos are over. Oh, too bad. Ah, believe me, I'm not going to ask anymore. <laughs> I lost the job. <laughs> and the, the greatness of the Sopranos is that it relates to everybody. Um, it, no matter what your intelligence level, what your background, you get something out of everything in that show. And, and if you watch it over and over again, you get every episode contains so much. I mean, it just it just does. So you can't watch it on the TV when the curses are cut out and like the guy gets run over. See, I like that. Good stuff. I like it with no curses. <laughs> Everybody else hates it. That's what my mother curses. says. I like it without the curses. <laughs> <laughs> but but the curses are the vernacular, and they they are part of that life, and they really do express uh, that that level of communication that these men have. Mm -hmm. They're not exactly PhDs. They're uh, no, exactly. They're street guys. So. Yeah, that's the only way it's going to be. So now, listen. Why don't you talk about some of the other TV and movie appearances that you actually been in through your life? Okay, I. Uh, I, I did a, <laughs> I did a, my f f starring role in a film was called Don't Go in the House in 1980. Yeah, yeah. It was the top grosser in the country. <laughs> Outgrossed The Shining. That was a horror movie, With Jack movie, Nicholson. Right? It was yeah, a really? horror movie. Yeah. And in those days, and this is how the business has changed, how the business became, went from product oriented to corporate and profit and loss oriented. In those days, when I did that, The Shining was in its second week. Don't Go in the House was in the first week. We were the top grosser in the country. The only problem was gross figures were only at the back page of Variety. Nobody knew what a film made really? money-wise. Yeah. You, today, if I made that picture today, I would be on every talk show. I would have three picture deals. Yeah. I, because it would be, everybody knows every monetary profit, or gross rather, that every movie makes. We all know, right. oh, you know, Joe Blow this week made six million dollars. Next week it's number two. Yeah, well, Entertainment Magazine, that's what it has. Every, and every news, every news casting, everybody knows the gross figures. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if the product is good. Mm -hmm. Only matters how much money it makes. And back then, it was 350 a ticket. So, and we grossed 12 million. The, the film was made for 250, and we, we made over, I don't know, 15, 16 million dollars. Back that then, was a lot of money. Back then. It was a lot of money, a lot of money. I didn't wow. get it, but it was a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> And then I've done my share of law and order. You know, when you're a New York actor, I'm a stage actor. I was trained on the stage, trained by Strasburg. I'm a method actor. I'm a member of the actor's studio. And so the stage is my love. Uh, film and TV are a different kind of craft. You use a different technique to, to, uh, to accomplish things on film and TV. And it's great. Stage, you have that instant gratification that you have that relationship with the audience, which is, which is I mean, you can't even, you can't explain it, what it's like to be up on a, on a stage and dealing with an audience That's in, hard. in that way. It, it's great. It's great. It's, it, it's hard work. It is hard work. You brought in a role in The Sopranos, right? What's that? You brought in a role in The Sopranos, a clip. Oh, yeah, I did, yes. Yeah, we call it Roland. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, I brought one in. That you, that you got for me. Yeah, this is the best. I don't know what it is. All actors, some reason, and like the older guys, I go, he goes, Johnny, I don't got a Roland. I go, why not? He has it on VHS tape. So I go, I, go, I got the Sopranos. About an hour before I got here, we're going through the episodes of my TV. I, my hair ain't even done yet. I had, I had my DVDs out in Long Island. <laughs> Unbelievable. So I'm going to show you the part when uh, you and Christopher start fighting at, at the, uh, the right, construction yeah. site. How's that? That's terrific. That's All right, a, control that's a great room. Scene. Check it out. Oh, look what the cat dragged in. Oh, 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 come back for more, huh? Oh, floor tiles now. You little prick. Oh, oh, come on, come on. Whoa, 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 relax, fellas. Mind your business. What I say? I distinctly told you to lay off this job. Talk to Silvio. He gave the order, you stupid. Yeah. What'd you call me? Huh? That's right. That's right. Little tough guy, huh? Who, you bastard? Chris, come on. You come work on. for me, not f***ing Silvio. I told you to knock it off. I'm calling the police. And don't think I forgot about you going through my fucking fiance's underwear drawer. That wasn't me, you f***ing jerk. We'll see, huh? So, who the f*** are you? Ralph Bunch over here. Oh. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that was one of my favorite scenes. I, you know what? Uh, Gandolfini said that was the best hit the, when I hit the guy with the pipe. Oh, that, that was, was great. Did yeah, really hit nice him? Was it a real pipe there. or was it? It was interesting. No, it wasn't. First of all, I was uh, Chase. One of the things Chase and all the writers, as they got to know you, know you, they wrote for you. And I told him he didn't know this, but I told him when I read that scene, 
My father's nickname was Lead Pipe Louie. <laughs> and I picked up a lead pipe and hit a guy over the head. I just thought it was the, you know, the coincidence of it was too close. But interestingly enough, um, it was, no, it was a, it was a, a dowel, a dowel with, uh, with, with, which was wrapped with, uh, with, with styrofoam. Oh, really? But the first time I hit the guy, it snapped and it hit him in the eye. And I was just, I was devastated. I, I thought I hurt him. I thought I, you know, I thought something went wrong, but it didn't. It was fine. I mean, he was a, he was a very he yeah. was a big stunt guy. And uh, so the sound, I think, was the sound of a, like a aluminum yeah. baseball bat or something. So the sound was incredible. And the thing I liked about it was uh, when we grew up as kids, yeah, I grew up in Brooklyn, and you never telegraphed your punch. So I really wanted... That not you couldn't see where that pipe was coming from, so I think when you see that scene, you don't see where it's coming right. from. So I was happy with the fact that I, I could still hit somebody with a pipe without them knowing it was coming. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I love that nickname. That's cute. Lead pipe, Louis. Yeah, that's my, my dad's name is Louis. So is that right? <laughs> yeah, I have to, might use that. <laughs> now before we go, talk about you mentioned the Actors uh, Studios before. Right. Are you involved with it or? Yes, I am. I I've been a member since 1988. It's a very difficult. It's a difficult place to get into. You have to audition and you have to be accepted. Lee Strasberg, when he was alive, sometimes would only take one actor. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of very crafted, skilled actors who are members, and there's a lot of people there who spend their whole lives studying the craft, but don't really get the opportunities yeah. that I've gotten. And and so it's that. I, I right now I'm I'm currently taking a a, a voice. We they offer a lot of uh, of opportunities for the actors to build their craft. So I'm taking a voice. Uh, a voice class on Tuesday nights uh, for, for 12 weeks and um, you go there and it, you don't it's free once you get in you remember for life and what you do is you go to to improve your craft mm -hmm. right. and so you'll put on a scene and then members will comment on on your on your work and it's it's I always say it's the toughest stage in the world because no matter what, you you get hit pretty hard. You get you get good constructive criticism, oh, sure. which is uh, which is you have to be able to take. And uh, but when you walk off the stage, you've always grown as an actor. You always so, you feel like some part of you has the confidence in what you do has increased, and, and it makes you a better actor. Uh, but it's you take you take some real good beatings up there. I'll tell you. <laughs> now what's this in the grave for? here you're being in blue. You're going to be working on Blue Bloods. Yes, this week? I, I. That's true. Fortunately, just uh, I just. Uh, I just booked a uh, guest star on Blue Bloods. We, I start shooting on Monday. I shoot next week. Um, I play uh, I play a uh, a hitman. <laughs> oh, what a stretch! <laughs> <laughs> now, Danny, is, that's our time. Is you have a Facebook uh, website, email anybody can get in touch with you at? My email is uh, dgrimaldi at aol .com. And I'm not on Facebook because I would probably be on it 23 out of 24 hours. So I don't want to waste my time on that. <laughs> so I'm not on Twitter and I'm not on Facebook, but I am on email. That's enough for me. That's cool. Danny, thank you very oh, much. You're my part pleasure. of the Late Night Crew. Everybody, pleasure. Dan Gomalde. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Have, have a seat. All right. Danny Gomalde, everybody.